Oh, Mr. President, thank you indeed for such a generous, over generous welcome. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, in the grace of God, which is in Jesus Christ our Lord, I'm grateful for the invitation that was extended to me, and I'm joyful in your midst tonight. But at the same time, in fear and trembling, <laughs> I'm deeply impressed with the task that has been entrusted to me before such a distinguished audience and after such distinguished predecessors. I tremble that I have to offer you the fruit of reflections, which I hope are worth considering, but which may sound strange in your ears. My French accent and whatever awkward use of English I may uh, make are the symbol of, I think, the foreign character of some of the things I'm going to say, of many of my references, of my context, interests. So uh, I hope you will bear with that. I beg your, your patience. And I cannot rule out the idea of also idiosyncrasy in, in this, this affair. I want also, before I really start on my topic, uh, to say how happy I am to serve the memory of uh, Professor Kenneth Cancer. I remember when, when I was a first year student in theology, I was in London, UK at that time, I was daunted by the majesty of that Mount Everest of theology, Calvert, Church of Dogmatics. And I was looking for a guide, and I found an article by Dr. Cancer, an article for students. And it was a great help to me. It gave me the orientation I needed before I read more extensively Karl Barth. <laughs> that was one thing. In later years, I was especially pleased with the fruit of his work on Calvin's view of scripture, a subject on which some well-known scholars, I think, have taken divergent routes and not been so uh, satisfactory in their scholarship. And I think Dr. Kanzer has done a quasi-definitive job, very, very rigorous work on, on this topic. And then, finally, I have remembrances of a week we, we spent together. We were together on a the team with such others as James Packer, Von Grounds, Arthur Glasser, uh, which drafted and, and wrote the Willowbank Declaration on the Gospel and the Jewish people, which I think on this subject was something of an important document. And so we were together on that, <laughs> Dr. Kanzer and myself, and uh, I'm grateful for the memory I can keep. But now I come to my subject. <laughs> And I have chosen as an epigraph the verse in the first chapter of James' epistle, verses 13 and following. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. An IV translation. The problem of evil is the problem of problems. This may and should be interpreted in the Hebrew way, the, using the Hebrew idiom, which is understandable in every language, uh, the superlative, the most difficult of all problems. But it can also be interpreted in the sense of plurality. 
Professor Feinberg has insisted that we should discern several questions of evil in a different, but I think not unrelated way, I would highlight three key interrogations. Whence evil was already on the lips of Greek thinkers? And this question, whence, is very near to the question why, which goes with it. Origin, whence, and reason why are very close as the intermediate ground attests. Ground is at, at the same time the origin and, and the reason. This is the topic that the verse in James uh, already touches upon. God is tempting me. God is the origin, <laughs> the author of that temptation and therefore of evil. Some people were reasoning that way and James is strongly reacting against that view. The second question is, what? What is evil? Saint Augustine, I pronounce Augustine, I, I think maybe you say Augustine, but uh, I mix now uh, UK English and, and US English sometimes. <laughs> so I say Augustine. Uh, Augustine argued that the question, what should precede this, he said, to rebut the Manichaean's claims. They boasted they had an answer to the whence question. And he replied, but the what question should be first. And the third question is no less ancient. It is the crying prayer of the psalmist, the lament of many, and also the, the anguished question of Habakkuk, the prophet. Habakkuk raises the problem of evil in history. How can it be uh, all uh, this unrighteousness uh, in the land and then such a strange way of reacting from the Lord's part, using those horrible pagans and his eyes as too pure to see evil. How can that be? Uh, how long? O oh Lord, how long, O oh Lord, he starts with this plaintive question. You know that Professor Carson aptly chose this phrase for one of his titles. One could think of that as the more existential question of evil. In the history of human thought and Christian thought, the focus has been set on the question of whence, why? Why this priority of why? Arguably, how long would be of even more important uh, significance. I will comment in, in a minute on the quest for rational accounts of the origin of evil, but I already offer some elements of an answer. The question of why arises on the very plane where thinking is established. It's quite normal that when the reason is at work, reason should ask about the reasons for evil. Evil is the great challenge for any reason. We can also say that the question of the essence, nature, definition, contours, what is evil, is of one piece with the question of whence. You cannot answer the question whence without having an idea of evil, but you cannot also really grasp the reality of evil without some idea of its origin. So the two are really uh, to be taken together. And even the third question, the question how long, in a sense, presupposes the question why. We all know that you have to diagnose the sickness, find the cause behind or under the symptoms in order to find the right therapy and in order to reach to the end of the sickness. How long? Well, as long as the disorder 
has not been identified, the etiology discovered enabling doctors to prescribe the relevant medicine. So you see, we should not isolate from one another the three main questions, and it is legitimate to start, at least, with this question, whence or why, not forgetting the others. In years past, some of you may know, I tried to deal with the problem of evil, and now revisit the area, but I intend to concentrate on a rather particular issue. What is the role of the notion of the possible in attempts at explanations of evil, at attempts at an answer to the question whence and why. It is legitimate to search for rational explanations. This I want to stress first. This is not a whimsical impulse in the minds of fringe intellectuals or even a perverse uh, pathology of the mind, it represents a challenge for all thinkers. It touches the nerve of what is properly human. The human creature feels the urge to bring out of uh, the maze of uninterpreted experience some kind of order, and therefore meaning. We cannot be satisfied with the tumult of chaotic perception. We don't live on bread alone as humans. Humans absolutely need meaning as the Vienna psychiatrist Viktor Frankl, a survival of the Nazi camps, Nazi death camps, demonstrated. We cannot be satisfied before we have reached a unified vision. We see connections. We have some answer to the question, why? This is true of all. But those individuals who can devote all their energies to the thinking endeavor are under a heightened obligation. Paul Ricoeur, who was already mentioned, and to whom I was at least in a privileged position, quite near to him at a few, on a few occasions, and I owe him a great debt, and I benefited from his benevolence. He could have <laughs> struck me down if he had wanted after some criticisms I had published, but he was very generous and kind and gentle. He wrote in his book, Symbolism of Evil, philosophy must comprehend all things, including religion. Philosophy cannot stop halfway. Philosophy has sworn, when it started, the oath of coherence. Philosophy must keep its promise to the end. You see, there is a strong statement of duty in calling in this. The experience of evil is the challenge as I told you, it is the obstacle. The raw and naive experience of evil is very close to that of disorder. So if we need order of the absurd, if we need meaning, human reason cannot rest as it confronts this alien reality. It must try to tame evil. We may note that the impulse towards rational explanation uh, have of themselves an existential of practical import, even before we consider the strategy against evil that it may render possible. Reaching uh, a, an intellectually satisfying answer to the why question has a soothing effect in the whole inner person. St. Augustine started his early work very soon after conversion on free will with the distinction between two kinds of evil, the evil we have committed and the evil we are suffering of. 
and for both explanation is helpful. If I suffer, it makes acceptance a little easier for me. It loosens the grip of anguish. And if I have done wrong, if I'm guilty, knowing why probably lightens the weight of my guilt or remorse. And I would warn very briefly against dichotomies between theoretical and practical, intellectual and existential. I think this is not biblical at all, and that it can be criticized analytically to a great extent. When we think it is a kind of behavior, and we use strategies, and we may be more or less straightforward, more or less honest, and so on, in our theoretical work. Among all thinkers, Christian thinkers, feel or should feel maybe the strongest motivation towards a rational explanation of evil. On the one hand, they preach order with a purer force than anyone else. They affirm one principle of all that is. Monotheism, everything from him, through him, to him. And they confess the perfect goodness of that one and of his work. Therefore, we expect a vision of total harmony, of unified fullness. And yet, Christian thinkers cannot explain away the experience of evil as an optical illusion. Their sacred scriptures themselves, from the second page to the last page, denounce evil as the problem. The emblem of Christianity is the cross. In hoc signo vinces, the cross, this disgusting atrocity, the unjust condemnation of the only perfectly righteous man who ever lived on earth. How can it be? One God, perfectly good, from whom everything, and then the cross. The difficulty which already, according to Lactentius, the church father Lactentius, in his book, the Ira Dei, uh, the philosopher, the Greek philosopher Epicurus, had uh, pointed to it, saying it is impossible to reconcile almighty reign or uh, disposition of things, goodness, and the reality of evil. And this reaches the highest degree of acuteness for Christians. They have faced the challenge. Proposals have been made quite varied throughout history. Not a few among the authors of these have openly renounced important tenets of biblical faith. And others may have done so in a more hidden manner. But they have tried in the name of Christianity. I examined typical examples and concluded that they all failed as rational explanations. The presence of evil under the sovereignty of our God remains, and I argued must remain, an opaque mystery. I will again try to show that far from being a weakness, this is a blazing mark of transcendent truth. But the bulk of my present undertaking throughout these lectures will be devoted to the way uh, as would-be explanations use the concept of the possible. I suspect that they do so in too facile a manner. And it is in this sense that my title uses the phrase a misleading facility. They have tried to explain, and I think we should see how they have done it with the category possibility. First, a few samples 
of that use of the category possibility in order to find a rational explanation. And therefore, a justification of God is theodicy, as the name goes. Very simply, first, this common sense, apparently common sense proposition, since evil arose, it was possible. The possibility of evil, to start with, gives us uh, an element of explanation why it arose whence evil well from its possibility. This sounds pretty obvious and it leads naturally to the next proposition. Uh, when, what, what kind was this uh, possibility? First example, that of Greek thought already to some, uh, to some extent, and then it influenced on Christian thinkers. Aristotle used the category of the possible uh, in an intensive way as one of the pillars of his ontology. Uh, the, the word was dynamis. Being has two basic modes, he argued. Being potential, being in dynamis and dynamé, and, and being in act, being realized, actualized. This is the fundamental analysis uh, of being, and it is coupled with another pair of concepts, of which it is very near. They look like equivalent pairs in. in many, many Aristotelian passages. That of matter, which corresponds to possibility, but dynamis, and form, which corresponds to being in act. This is the main structure of Aristotle's uh, ontology. You find it in the books that were entitled long before his death, long, long after his death, uh, Metaphysics, because it came after his book on physics in, in, in the way the books were arranged long after his death. But from that, the name Metaphysics uh, took the, the meaning it has had in, in history. In Metaphysics, in several of the books of Metaphysics, for instance, book Theta, uh, he deals with uh, those themes and it is clear in his doctrine that what may be called evil is produced by matter, by a kind of resistance of matter. Matter is the possibility of form. It receives any form. It is the unformed, and it is the maximum uh, of possibility, because it, it is a possibility open to any formation. Now this, in Aristotle's doctrine, curiously, because he does not explain it, uh, this matter does offer an element of resistance. Hence accidents. Accidents are not rational. Uh, forms are rational, but you have accidents. You have monsters that are being born. You have what corresponds to evil. This was not a central problem for him. But he does assign to matter, dynamis in the sense of potentiality, he does assign to matter the origin of evil. Plotinus, who made a powerful recapitulation of all the work of uh, Greek philosophy before him is even clearer on this. He takes from Aristotle this idea of matter, though he insists it is not passive uh, matter, which is uh, non-being, but non-being in a relative sense, not absolutely nothing, but a, 
uh, something intermediate to pure non-being and being. Matter, which is non-being, is also evil. In Plotinus, this is clearly affirmed. And this deeply influenced many church fathers after him. He has had the same teacher, probably, than Origen. <laughs> they, they were both, maybe not at the same time, probably not at the same time, but the, the students of Ammonius Saccas in uh, uh, Egypt, in Alexandria, and uh, there has been an influence of this Neoplatonism of which Plotinus is the major thinker on origin and on many, maybe most, church fathers uh, after uh, him, uh, and uh, especially the greatest of all church fathers who came in his time toward the end, uh, as again a, a man of a great synthesis, an original synthesis, Augustine. Augustine was deeply influenced by Plotinus. Actually, there are some historians who have spoken of two conversions of Augustine. One, the first conversion to Neoplatonism, to Plotinus, if you like, and then the second conversion to Christianity. Because he was freed from the hold that uh, Manichaeism had had on him by the reading of the Neoplatonists. But uh, in any case, this is probably too, too rigid a scheme, but uh, there has been shown that there are many, many passages in Augustine's writings that correspond to things that Plotinus had written and which Augustine uh, had read. Now, uh, Augustine is highly biblical. He's also one of the most biblically uh, impregnated uh, church fathers. He had a fantastic memory. <laughs> so uh, he couldn't accept at all the idea that uh, matter is the uh, lowest of all the uh, realities which emanate from the one, the unspeakable one, uh, higher. Uh, he couldn't accept this idea of matter uncreated. Uh, he couldn't accept the idea of matter evil because of the Bible, because of the revelation in Genesis. And this is why he uh, constantly came back to Genesis. He wrote several books on Genesis, uh, despite all, all the burden of work that was on his shoulders. <laughs> Uh, Augustine couldn't accept Plotinus' scheme as it was. And he uh, affirmed the goodness even of matter, which was created uh, uh, at the first moment of the world. Yet at the same time, many interpreters do recognize that there was an influence of Plotinus' view, and Augustine fathered the explanation of evil that was predominant through centuries and centuries after him. There was a suspicion of bodiliness, an emphasis on sensuousness as the great trap, <laughs> and especially in the, in the sexual expression of it. You probably know about that. This was a very heavy emphasis in uh, at least one millennium of Christianity, probably one millennium and a half uh, after uh, Augustine. Matter still was definitely inferior, though created good, he would say. But, uh, but there was also another theme, I think more important for our uh, review uh, tonight. Since all creatures are not emanating from God, not from God's substance. They have been created from nothing, ex nihilo. Uh, Augustine affirmed uh, 
of course, quite correctly. But he concluded from that their fallibility, that if creatures are created ex nihilo, then they have the mark of nothingness on them. They have a tendency to uh, nothingness. They are fallible, and if they are fallible, it's not so uh, surprising they fail. See? That is clearly an element in Augustine's understanding of evil. And this we find in doctors after him, in Thomas Aquinas, which is quite clear on, the, on this uh, uh, topic. And uh, I uh, would like to read you, from you, uh, for you, <laughs> excuse me, a passage from a commentator of St. Thomas Aquinas, uh, showing how far this understanding of the ex nihilo creation plays the role of a, a, an explanation why evil arose. Antonin Dominique Sertillange, who was a major thinker in his generation, and a Thomist, writes, since it emanated from God, common being is always mixed with potentiality. And therefore, prepared to fall. Only the perfection of the act makes it possible to avoid falling. When starting with the higher creatures, degrees of participation in the good constantly decline in the direction of pure potentiality, the dose of evil must rise in an altogether similar proportion. The inevitable condition of creaturely being degradation in the philosophical sense of the term, that is, being a mixture of act and potentiality, makes of it the absolutely first origin of evil. Thomas Aquinas, in the Theological Sum, first book, question 48, <laughs> definitely writes that it is in the nature of things that if creatures are fallible, then they fall at one time or another. He definitely states this explanation of evil, despite his caution on many other points. We should come back when we try to describe his notion of possibility. And Thomist down to our own days, or at least mine, <laughs> Thomists have followed uh, the same course. Jacques Maritain, famous Thomist, not a priest, a famous Thomist philosopher in, in France, who was chosen as a representative of all lay Catholic Christians at the end of Vatican II. He was chosen to receive the message of the council to all uh, lay people. So Jacques Maritain speaks of the bite of nothingness. See? I said the mark a few minutes, a few instants ago. Uh, he says the bite of nothingness. Creature as such has the bite of nothingness on it. And this explains why it falls. Second sample of this role, the category of the possible plays, Leibniz, Gottfried Leibniz, who had read the scholastics. In his Theodicee, Theodicee he coined the word and wrote it, this book in French. Uh, in his Theodicee, he chooses possibility uh, as a key category at different levels. He postulates, as an obvious rule of method, that you are to draw the consequence if something is actual, that it was possible before. Ab actu ad potentiam valet consequente, he said, he wrote. He states that God created man innocent, but ready to fall. That the evil that affects a person belong to the person's idea 
before its existence, when it was possible in the mind of God. And in several quotations, he definitely states that the origin of evil is found is the essences of all possible words that before God exercised his will, made any decision, were part of the divine essence in the divine mind. So he definitely states that possibility, the possibility of uh, worlds, as he called them, is the source of evil. Friedrich Schelling, one of uh, the powerful romantic philosophers of Germany at the end of the, 19th, the 18th and beginning of the 19th century, uh, was critical of Leibniz with some pointed uh, remarks. But in his own work on human freedom, on the nature of human freedom, but Heidegger said, actually, it is on the problem of evil, that book, a Philosophical Consideration on the Nature uh, of Human Freedom, also finds a possibility of evil in, at the bottom of things, at the bottom of the divine being, for there is something below human, uh, below divine nature. There is a duality there. It is still united in God himself, but when it becomes dissociated, this is evil. And this is what happens in the history of the world and in uh, human life especially. This divisibility, if I may use that word, is considered to be the origin of evil. He definitely states the same. He depends to a large degree from Oettinger and from Burme, Jacob Burme, the philosophus Teutonicus, this genial cobbler who devised the philosophy which had, has had an immense influence on Karl Marx also. There is the axiom uh, in, in Burme and then in Schelling that each being cannot reveal itself except in its opposite. Love in hatred, unity in conflict, I'm quoting. So you see uh, another version of the possibility as the root of evil. Berdyaev was powerfully influenced by Schelling and Burme in his notion of freedom, and also Paul Tillich. Paul Tillich wrote his doctoral dissertation as a young scholar on Schelling. And you can find uh, points of contact, obvious. Third sample, main sample, such witnesses of uh, uh, attempts uh, of uh, explanation, at explanation, speak of freedom. But the third type I select focuses more directly on freedom and possibility. It is a widely held solution that freedom includes the possibility of evil. And if evil arose, it is because it is uh, an element of freedom. You are familiar with the argument, I'm quite sure. Freedom, expressed in free willing, is defined by the ability either to say yes or to say no, to turn to the right or to turn to the left. And without freedom, no love is possible. God, therefore, who wanted to raise covenant partners, sons and daughters, who could love him, endowed them with freedom. And he took the risk. Risk is the possibility of something uh, mishappening. He took the risk of the wrong answer. The only alternative, we are told along this third line, would have been creating marionettes, which would have been a less satisfactory course. 
although we can find forerunners, Augustine again may be credited with initiating this line of explanation. And it is not absent, without the, uh, not absent from the writings of Augustinians. It may be, at least this is the interpretation of some, it, it may be that there are tensions in Augustine over this affirmation of free will. His adversary, the Pelagians, claimed so in his life. He tried to protest, but there may be serious tensions indeed. I leave this question of historical interpretation of Augustine to the sign for the time being, but I mentioned that many evangelical thinkers have adopted this line of explanation. Many uh, theologians, I may mention a book by Norman Geisler, for instance, many philosophers, Alvin Plantinga is a major thinker of our day, with this free will explanation of the origin of evil. And we could have also quotations of Catholics. It is quite common among Catholic thinkers in our days. This, this is a third line. One could maybe add Kierkegaard, Søren Kierkegaard, the Danish Lutheran thinker of the 19th century, since he insists so strongly on freedom, and he is called, as you know, the father of existentialism. He wrote, quote, freedom is infinite and arises out of nothing. And anxiety, dread, which is the preparation for sin, resembles a fit of dizziness before the abyss of possibility. I, I quote again, anxiety is the dizziness of freedom which emerges when the spirit wants to posit the synthesis, the synthesis of time and eternity, and freedom looks down it, into its own possibility. Anxiety or dread, it were the two translations in, in English, angst is the condition of sin. However, we should immediately add that Kierkegaard was always very, very clear. This does not explain that sin arose. There is a leap, even if we discern possibility, the possibility of sin and anxiety, it does not explain the reality of it. You have a leap, a qualitative leap, very important in his eyes. And also we may note that his notion of freedom, which is characterized by possibility, a pure possibility, a, a, a depth which is dizzying, is not the free will of the thinkers I mentioned before. He definitely agrees with Leibniz that this freedom defined as the power either to say yes or to say no is a chimera, is a superficial. He, he, he quotes Leibniz himself to say that he agrees with that. So Kierkegaard is difficult to uh, put in the pigeonhole in the brief typology I'm drawing. Why do I say that this is too facile, using possibility in this way? I think that it is too facile because the notion of the possible has not been criticized by most of them, at least. The word is used, the notion as it comes like this uh, has been uh, set, set forth but what do we mean by possibility? When are we uh, entitled to speak of possibility? How should we conceive of the possible? This is a question that has received, uh, I think, too little attention. And actually, Leibniz says it. Uh, because of time, I'll not read the full quotation, but he does say that 
This is a notion so basic that we often use it without thinking about it, uh, just have, uh, with a few others, but that they require much more attention. And we, we must disentangle what is implied uh, in them. Long ago, my attention to this ambiguity, slippery character of the notion of possibility, was uh, awakened by a difficulty in theology you may have encountered. The question about Jesus' temptation. Was it possible for Jesus to succumb to temptation or not? You were caught in a dilemma. If you say, yes, it was possible, and you consider his divine nature, well, this is almost blasphemy. God himself sinning? This is an impossible thought. This must be ruled out immediately, chased away. But if you say, no, it was not possible for him to fall, then the very trial of temptation seems to lose its point, no longer be serious, be reduced to a mere show. Uh, and the logic in the epistle to the Hebrews that Jesus, having been tempted, <laughs> is able to uh, come to our help when we are tempted, this logic seems to uh, dissolve. So you see the dilemma? I think the only way to get out of it, the dilemma, is precisely to distinguish levels, modes, maybe even concepts of possibility. The question is a, a trap because we use the word possible without having examined what possibility may mean. And a, a glance at history again may help us to see that this is a work to be done. There have, have been those who have denied the validity of the concept of possibility. This was the case of Spinoza, already a few in, in uh, Greek or Roman antiquity. But uh, Spinoza especially is very clear. It is practically an illusion. It is purely subjective. It does not correspond to anything. In the reality, everything is perfectly determined. There is no alternative. <laughs> And if we think otherwise, when we uh, use the notion of the possible, it's just because we don't know. We do use, in, in, in everyday life, the word possible uh, in such a way, knowing that there is no indeterminacy uh, in, in the thing themselves. If I say, uh, it is possible that I ate uh, cereals of yesterday morning, but I don't remember, so it's possible. <laughs> the fact, of course, is entirely determined whether yes or no, but uh, it is simply that I don't know. But this is not very interesting for uh, our reflection, and Spinoza says there is no other idea of possibility. Henri Bergson, who was very popular as a philosopher in the beginning of the 20th century, he was drawing universal admiration, criticized the notion of possibility. Actually, he said the possibility does not precede reality. It derived from it through a kind of retrospective projection. Then a distinction was made by Aristotle already. We say dynamis. We use the word can, we can. But it may refer to active power, the ability to do things, or to passive power, which is its correlate, and which we usually refer to with the word potentiality. What is virtual potential? Matter has power in that sense, not the power of uh, doing acts but of receiving uh, the form in order 
to uh, re reach to being an act, passive power. This is an altogether different meaning. And I suspect that in the use of the word potentiality, things that belong to active power are illegit illegitimately transferred to passive power, mere potentiality. Kierkegaard, others also, but I found it first in Kierkegaard, in the, in the concept of angst, speaks of a distinction between real possibility and, he says, ideal possibility. I will rather say logical or abstract possibility. This, again, is a very important distinction. When we say possible, what do we mean? Something already real? such as that nothingness which Maritain says bites <laughs> all creatures, hmm? or not. Something purely abstract. See, we must be clear on this. Quotation by Mar Maritain on potentiality. We have before us something which does not deserve to be called being, which may only receive that name in a secondary improper way, as it were, as one give alms, and yet is real. <laughs> see? see the ambiguity there with this notion of possibility? And then a quotation which comes from that Mount Everest I mentioned uh, in the beginning of my talk. Karl Barth, in volume four, first part, inveys against anything which could suggest a measure of complacency uh, about evil. And he writes, that man should actually sin does not constitute a possibility of his freedom as a rational creature. However one tries, when one sees in the freedom to disobey a possibility of human nature, one will always find a way to excuse it with a foundation in man as he is. And he says, one can only speak negatively. Since man is not God, he is not invulnerable. And thus, the absurd event of sin was not and is not ruled out. But not more than that. No, we shouldn't speak of possibility. So you see, with all these references, I hope I have convinced you that we ought to examine this notion of possibility and the role it plays in theories that tries to tame the disorder of, of evil. But now the way for us to travel, I must be brief, I will summarize, but uh, I still, my hour is not full yet. Uh, the way we ought to travel. Some of you may be surprised. Most of the names I have mentioned so far are found in history of philosophy handbooks or encyclopedias. But I am supposed to give lectures in revealed theology. So I owe you a word of explanation on this. Actually, many of the thinkers I have named were also theologians. Well, of course, for the ancient, it goes without saying. For Augustine, you have wisdom and the quest for wisdom. And you have no division between theology and philosophy at all. It first started, according to Etienne Gilson, in the 12th century. And Thomas Aquinas is both a philosopher and a theologian. And his achievement is a close union of the two, uh, distinction and union at the same time, uh, clear coordination. Spinoza, Spinoza, I said. Well, he was, of course, the apostate. That was the image he left in his generation for his contemporaries. But he wrote a tractatus theologico politicus. One of his few books has theology in the title. And he shows himself in that book, well-versed in Old Testament exegesis. 
he doesn't say Old Testament, of course. He had written a Hebrew grammar as a tool for uh, study of the uh, original Hebrew text. Uh, he was a theologian in his way, and the founder, probably, of biblical criticism, of liberal biblical criticism. Leibniz. Leibniz, he was everything at once. He was, of course, the great mathematical discoverer, major name in the history of mathematics, the founder of infinitesimal calculus. He was a historian a diplomat, a lawyer. He had a doctorate in law very early in life, a pioneer of ecumenical dialogue. Also, Fontenelle compared him to those charioteers of antiquity who could direct at once eight horses before them in front. He was able to do everything at, at the same time. And he was highly competent, not only in scholastic theology, but also, I discovered it, I had not read it, read him extensively before I prepared for these lectures. I discovered with amazement how familiar conversant he was with Lutheran and Reformed divines of the 17th century. He had read them carefully, and he had a very clear understanding of what they had said. Schelling. Schelling was a former theological student in the Stift, the famous uh, Tübingen Institute or Seminary. And Kierkegaard. Kierkegaard, of course, had been a theological student, had passed his examinations, could have been a pastor. He, he very seldom preached orally, he wrote sermons, but he did preach a very few times at communion services. So Kierkegaard was a theologian. Ricoeur, Paul Ricoeur. Well, while he was a student of philosophy in the 30s in, in Paris, he also followed the courses of the Faculty of Theology. Uh, so you see all these, uh, or not maybe all, but many of those I've mentioned have also a, a theological training, competence, and interest. And then I must say I will not deal with my subject and with sometimes philosophical ideas as a philosopher. I am not a philosopher. I refuse to tremble before the taboo of the separation of disciplines. Unfortunately, Paul Ricoeur did maintain that taboo and in his small work on evil, on the, on the problem of evil, he seems to consider as unanswerable the, uh, the interdiction, the, the refusal uh, of ontotheology. This was the phrase of Heidegger, and many, many theologians are in fear before it interdict, uh, I refuse to bow before it. I do think this corresponds to a philosophical framework that is alien to scripture and that we are not to adopt uh, in, in, our, uh, in our case. Of course, part of the critique is on the target, but we cannot adopt the presuppositions of this division between theology and philosophy. What working as a, philo as a theologian and not a philosopher implies for me the sola and tota scriptura as the norm, as the only supreme norm, the norma normans, in, as the Latin goes. We speak of God because God first spoke to us. This is the key. To me, we love God because he first loved us. We speak of God because he first spoke to us, and the scriptures are his word written. I stand in that tradition, which 
will be represented by the book which Dr. Van Hooser mentioned, which is soon to appear after years of editing. Uh, I think this should be maintained at all cost. And using reason, the ability to analyze and synthesize, to perceive the necessity of consequences reverently applied, not without presuppositions. I don't think there is reason without presupposition. But within the fiduciary framework, Polanyi's phrase, uh, of the biblical worldview. Two points before I close. There are two especially sensitive areas uh, to methodology, uh, which I may mention now with just a word of comment. Uh, I have seen their importance in the various uh, treatments of the subject I have read. The first one is the role the concept of infinity is to play. I announced my remark on this, especially with Leibniz, but already with Thomas Aquinas and, and, and of course also Kierkegaard. Infinity plays a major role. And uh, I wonder if we are on our guards sufficiently about it. It is a very, very difficult concept to handle. Immediately you can see it when you think that we tend to oppose infinite and finite. But infinite includes finite. Otherwise it is not infinite. So you see immediately, ah! <laughs> it is a, a dizzying concept. And I like what the Chevalier de Mere, who was a, a, an influential intellectual in Pascal's time, wrote to Pascal. He said, as soon as the infinite enters an issue, however minimal the implication, the issue becomes impossible to explain because of the mind's disturbance and confusion. <laughs> I think this is, to a large extent, quite true. <laughs> and we must be on the alert uh, for that. Uh, and I noticed that it is almost absent from scripture. Of course, scripture does never suggest a finite God. No, that's a horrible thought. But the notion of the infinite is not brought. And it, it is a contrast with later Jewish speculation. The Ein Sof plays a major role uh, in the Kabbalah and the philosophical uh, great system that have been developed later. And you don't find the phrase in, in the Old Testament. You don't find it. You find in mispar, without number, for the thoughts of God. To me, this is a warning about the use of this category. Second, second point, the use of the principle of non-contradiction. Again, I'm not saying that we, know, we shouldn't pay respect to it. There have been many many more or less important people in the history of Christianity that have claimed that God is above contradiction and therefore could also uh, justify contradiction. <laughs> this was uh, the case of a man in the beginning of the Middle Ages, but he became a cardinal, Pietro Damiani, Damianus, and who said, well, Samson was able to beat uh, the Philistines with a nice jaw. Uh, jaw. <laughs> well, we don't need the wisdom of philosophy. The jaw of a donkey is enough. <laughs> he, he considered that God can make that something which has happened has not happened. Not just erase the consequences, but that it has not happened. Truth changes. Contradiction is, is admitted. I don't think we should go this way because of scripture, because God cannot deny himself. This is the ground for the validity of the rule of non-contradiction. 
But then, having said that, we must add that it is extremely difficult to apply. Where is there contradiction? I, I just read uh, again my notes, and uh, Francisco Turretin, Turretinus, the great 17th century uh, reformed theologian, considered as obviously contradictory the idea of a God who, who has a body or irrational man. Well, well, are you so sure that it is a pure contradiction? <laughs> what are your criteria for that? Every evaluation, whether it is contradictory or not, uh, again occurs in the framework. Uh, you, you do it with presuppositions. And it is difficult to do it with all the, uh, the necessary rigor. We come at the end of a long history. And this is an advantage for us. We know now that brilliant minds can defend almost any thesis. <laughs> and so we shouldn't be entrapped by the brilliancy of a, a demonstration. There is one sure way, one light to guide us on our path, the Word of God in Scripture. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.